But for now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Henry Goodyear. Uh, we talked quite a lot about patients this morning, um, but obviously blockchain also impacts on doctors. Um, Henry is with a company called True. He's one of the co-founders. Um, he's also a doctor working in the NHS. So we're delighted to hear from him about a, a specific use case um, which, which affects doctors directly, which is medical credentialing, and which is something that is kind of um, picking up pace, not just here, but also in the US and in some other places. So first of all, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Um, so as a doctor, I guess people are often surprised um, with all the time you have um, to yourself, you know, all your spare time having hobbies and so on. You know, how do you manage to get interested and involved in blockchain? Um, and how soon after that was it that you actually started kind of working directly with the technology? Well, this week I think I've been on call for about 84 hours in the last four days. But uh, generally I try and squeeze as much as I can in the evenings. It was kind of by chance, just after starting work uh, in 2015, I was very surprised with how we organised our rotors and the difficulty we had in sourcing good quality locums and then we have to give feedback on those people after shifts. Um, and that was the main interest of my co-founder, Manny, who had a, an unfortunate run of bad experiences with locums he wasn't really able to give any feedback on. And we had an aim of trying to figure out the best way to identify these guys. So us, basically. As a hospital, they should know who they're employing. And for full-time staff, that, that is to some extent the case. Uh, they know when you first arrive, everything about you. The, the NHS employees guidance to have six uh, levels of identity checked. Uh, so it's very, very thorough. Um, but once you move on to the next hospital, you have another identity check, and you have another identity check, another identity check. And then you might go back to your old hospital to do a locum shift, or you might go to another hospital somewhere else. And you might be hired by an agency, you might be hired directly by the hospital. In that instance, you have to have another identity check. Or if you're hired by the agency, they will just say to the hospital, yes, you're, you're fine. Um, and it was by chance, well, when we started this project, we met uh, a guy from Evelyn, uh, who worked on the Sovereign Foundation. We were really introduced to blockchain and such. Uh, it wasn't that we necessarily sought it out, uh, but it's really just by happy coincidence that we've come across each other. Uh, and it's really helping us with uh, verification of credentials and the exchange of those in a really trusted way. And so um, you had a problem and blockchain sort of provided you with a potential solution, which is sometimes the opposite way from the way we see it, that people sort of see, oh, I must use blockchain for something, I'm going to find a, a use case or a problem to, to fix with that. Um, why do you think that medical credentialing is so important? I mean, you've mentioned already that it was just fixing a problem that you had, but for the broader NHS, um, what are the benefits, do you think? And how can blockchain specifically help with that? What, what is it about blockchain that helps with that? So there are a few key uh, friction points from our company point of view. The first is, is my friction point. So as a trainee, a doctor in training, there are, there are approximately 50,000 of us, and during the first 10 years of your training, you might work in somewhere between 10 and 15 hospitals. You have an identity check for all of those, you generally take sometimes a half a day or a day to have that identity check. You might spend more time creating all that information. Uh, so that's obviously a huge burden on the individual. In the hospital, it's a, a reasonable size teaching hospital with employing two full-time staff just to be doing those identity checks. That's a, a lot of manpower and effort across the country. Uh, on top of that, there's more kind of futuristic things, so telehealth. How do you know the person you're talking to, the other side of a phone, video camera, whatever, is a doctor? When you log into uh, a telehealth provider, how do you know that the service they're providing you is truly honest? When you go to a GP practice or you go to a hospital, you're in an environment where you know there are certain safety precautions for people being there, the people who have their, their lanyards on, uh, and you kind of work in an environment where you don't necessarily feel the need to check somebody and who they are. Um, but if you're meeting somebody over your laptop, that's probably a slightly different interaction. You, we want to try and make sure that we maintain that trust relationship between the patient and the doctor. And that, that's built on confidence, confidentiality, transparency, trust. You've got to be able to feel willing and open to share your worst concerns with somebody potentially over the phone. Uh, and that 
that's very difficult to replicate in the case. Yeah, and that seems like a growing area as well. I, I heard a bit of interesting research saying that patients actually rather trust uh, a kind of remote interaction than they would a face-to-face -face one with a doctor, which I was quite surprised about, but maybe because people have an embarrassment factor about talking about their health, it's potentially easier for them to do it in a sort of digital format. Um, so obviously there's kind of cost and efficiency savings for the system, there's kind of hassle factor for the doctors actually working in the system, and then there's a more, it's not really futuristic, but you know, to us, but to other people, futuristic prospect of you can have a consultation with an expert anywhere in the world, and we know it could be a dog, as Anko told us earlier on, but hopefully it's not a dog and it's actually a real human trained doctor. Um, so how far has this got in terms of real world implementation? We had um, Eric Fish here last year from the Federation of State Medical Boards who were working quite hard on trying to bring in medical credentialing there, but um, in terms of the NHS, how, how far have you actually got? Well, we've had uh, the new Chief, Chief People's Officer within part of the NHS long term plan to say that digital passporting is a fundamentally important part of the future of employment in the NHS and the aim of trying to maintain uh, also, of helping staff retention. Uh, and they're really keen on the idea of helping people have flexibility in work uh, so that you can work in different locations or uh, hours that suit your childcare needs, your personal interests. Um, then, so that, that's really from a top down management edict. They're, they're really keen to try and see this happen. Uh, from our point of view, we've just completed a pilot with the GMC writing their first digital verifiable credential, and that's been consumed by a hospital. And that hospital's then onboarded a team of doctors and then proven that they can share that information with their neighbouring hospital and onboard them without needing other face to face identity check. From that set of credentials, they've issued a work based credential, which gives a role based permission and access to all of their clinical systems with a password this time. So they now have access to 12 different clinical systems, which previously they had to remember usernames and passwords for, and now all they need to do is with their phone, providing they have a biometric or a long pin code on to, to unlock, they can face ID themselves, scan the QR code on the workstation, and immediately be logged into everything. Fantastic. I think you're going to show us in a minute a little bit about how it works and people can ask you some questions, but I just wanted to ask you to, to wrap up the, the chat part. Obviously the NHS is always a political football and we've got an election coming up in the UK um, not too far away from now and everyone's claiming to be the part of the NHS, which they always do. Um, what other use cases do you see for blockchain in the NHS other than medical credentialing? Do you think um, there are any that are bubbling up in addition to what you're working on and, and how much political will do you think is there for more blockchain in the NHS? And obviously that's a massive question, but we've got about two minutes to <laughs> talk uh, We've had a lot of heated debate today about patient records and uh, data sets. I think things like UK Biobank would be perhaps so it's a great place to start. It's a really huge data set that we want to be uh, used in best capacity. And these sort of centralized data silos are uh, always a bit of a, a risky area to be holding a vast amount of people's data. Um, and I think I'm probably more of a pessimist of our team, so I'm not possibly the best person to be asking what I see as the Future. Manny was saying, would he look he'd, more he'd give, me, he'd, he'd give me a more optimistic, enthusiastic answer, but I think, um, as we've seen this morning, there's, there's plenty of Well, I'm going to turn it over to you so, to run your demo and tell us a little bit about how it actually works. So I think we just need to so press, press the green button. Quick video. Uh, it's not, unfortunately, our actual system that is uh, running in Blackpool at the moment. This is the skin of the uh, PC, PCX credential system. So. Uh, this is our partner's Evanim platform, um, and it, it, it's really helpful as part of their accelerator and it helps teach us how to use our system as best as possible, which is the sovereign network. So on the left you see my phone screen yesterday evening, and on the right is the University Hospital Southampton, uh, and I'm just going to briefly run through basically uh, universities asking to see my professional registration, so my GMC license. So this is going to check that they've got a connection with me. Uh, I think I forgot which time to click on last time. And I'm going to ask for evidence of my GMC certificate. Um, I 
made lots of spelling mistakes in the past. <laughs> And so it just pops up quite quickly over Wi-Fi at home. Um, and you can see I'm still being sent rotors from people I don't work for anymore. The top right, but I'm just double checking that my GMT credential is correct. Uh, and that I'm sharing the one that's given to me by GMC. Uh, so you can, you can have your credentials issued by primary or secondary uh, credentialers. So primary being the people who originally wrote your certificate. So if you're sharing a driving license, it'd be the DLA. But the post office can check the driving license is okay and they could write a secondary credential on the system for you if that would be accepted. So then, now that the hospital has seen my GMC credential, they're giving me a load of password, password for system accesses. So this is effectively the equivalent of the role-based admission access that Blackboard Teaching Hospital has given a small cohort of their doctors. Uh, and I'm coming up some really imaginative passwords. Um, and once I have these, in theory, providing this connected to their Active Directory, uh, and they have it all set up with all their different clinical systems, it can then, just with the scan of a QR code with my phone, allow uh, me access to all the different clinical systems I'd normally have to know what it was Fantastic. Well, I'd love to um, see if anybody's got any questions for Henry to follow up. If anybody has got questions, just put your hand up. And uh, Mike is coming over to you now. I think there's David there. What do you want? Oh, the mic, my mic, actually, sorry. I'm hogging. Sorry, I seem to be hogging the mic. Um, great, great ideas uh, and projects. What's the main pushbacks at the moment? Uh, the main pushback is getting commitment to people to uh, potentially help fund our further development. And uh, we're We've not actually had too much pushback from hospitals. They're quite keen to get on board, but we don't necessarily have the level of information governance certification all processed thoroughly yet. We're still in some pen testing. Um, so it's really, I guess, a case of just making sure everything is really buttoned down from the information governance point of view, because there's some very thorough look, kind of hoops you have to jump through or anybody will install any system on the GMC uh, servers or any other <coughs> servers. So I, my first aim is to try and get as many trainees and nurses on board as possible within the UK. But the more ambition aim that we've kind of maybe slightly discussed amongst ourselves is to try and help create global health equality through good access to verifiable clinicians. Have, uh, within more developing countries, you have a huge number of people who perhaps work within health in the broader term, but they maybe practice uh, more uh, of, uh, tribal based medicine and they uh, sell their, their health care to local people uh, in exactly the same way as you might do with traditional Western medicine that's evidence based. Uh, and we want to be able to give people access to that, that choice of access to healthcare professionals. That's really interesting. And I mean, um, just to clarify, so at the moment the system is, is only for doctors or is it also for other healthcare so workers? So our pilot is ongoing uh, and the nurse is currently being onboarded. I would not finish that bit yet. Well, thank you so much, Henry. It's a fantastic project. It's really great to see how it's evolved because we had Manny last year and he was talking, but obviously you've done a lot in the past 12 months. So congratulations on how you're going and um, I hope you find more funding. Thank you very much.